Some people are partial to tea, some people are partial to coffee, but which is better for you across all causes of mortality? Cardiovascular health, even respiratory diseases and digestive diseases. The answer will stir up some controversy steeped in data-driven mystery as we brew a delicious... Yeah, I gotta be honest with you, I'm lost. I was trying to stick to, you know, a few different brewing analogies together that I sort of lost the plot. So let's just move on. In this uh, study, which involved almost 500,000 participants, quantified the amount of coffee and tea that people consume and tracked over 15 years and collected the amount of deaths or disease prevalence across that time. They then compared the disease or death prevalence in each drink condition, so coffee or tea, as well as the amount of consumption. So we'll go over the amounts too. Now, the idea behind looking at these drinks is because they share several factors between them, but they also have distinct compounds within them that may give one or the other an edge, like uh, Robo Wars, where one robot gets a flamethrower strapped to it and the other has a hefty hammer, except they're duking it out in your artery. Well, let's again move. Let's move on. The reality is coffee and tea share compounds like caffeine and chlorogenic acid. I have such trouble saying that. Chlorogenic acid is known to uh, act as an antioxidant itself, but also stimulates the production of antioxidants inside your cells. It also inhibits inflammation, reducing interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha levels. But tea contains compounds like other flavonoids, which stimulate molecules like nitric oxide, which lead to the opening of our arteries that drops blood pressure. On the other hand, coffee has molecules like melanoidins. Melanoidins. Another difficult one that, okay. Melanoidins, which can be taken up by microbes in our gut and produce beneficial fats that interact with our organs and also reduce inflammatory molecule production. These uh, same molecules also reduce the activity of other pro-inflammatory molecules like cyclooxygenases. So much we need to get into there, but the big point here is that while they share beneficial molecules, they also have distinct molecules in certain respects, which raises this question of, Will the hammer win or will the flamethrower? Let's look at the data. Round one. All cause mortality. Fight. Coffee is up top and tea is on the bottom. The dotted line is on both graphs it indicates the neutral risk, as in no added or reduced risk compared to people who don't consume coffee or tea. If the shaded lines fall below the dotted 1.0 line, that's reduced risk. And if it goes above, that's increased risk. The further right, the shaded lines, that indicates greater consumption of the respective drink. So clearly one to two cups of either drink is linked to the greatest reduction in risk. Fascinatingly though, greater coffee consumption above four cups per day seems to be linked to no benefit or increased risk. And yet we don't see that when looking at tea consumption. By the way, the tea is a mixed sample of green tea and black tea consumers. So based on these data, tea seems superior, but does that maintain when looking at specific disease states? Round two. Cardiovascular disease. Fight. In regard to cardiovascular disease, again, we see a somewhat similar situation. Again, we see an initial benefit of coffee that goes away with greater consumption. Although something similar happens with tea, we don't see that similarity until 10 or so cups of tea, which is pretty high. I'll spare you the Mortal Kombat fight <laughs> entrance and mention that we see here that this is also mostly the case when looking at respiratory and digestive diseases. These are defined as uh, flu and pneumonia, as well as bronchitis, emphysema, asthma, and COPD for the respiratory, and es esophageal, stomach and intestinal disorders, colitis, and even liver conditions like cirrhosis, among others for the digestive diseases. Strangely, even higher doses of co coffee seem to track with significant benefit in digestive diseases. But again, the nod seems to be toward tea consumption. So why do we see this loss of risk reduction, otherwise stated an increase in risk when we get to greater coffee consumption? And what's the optimal amount of each then? 
Also, what happens when you combine tea and coffee? Do you mutate into a superhuman with a troubled past? And what about uh, if you're younger than 60 or if you're not overweight or if you already consume a healthy diet? Are these results still apparent? Aside from the first two questions, which we'll get into shortly, there's a lot of additional questions that I'll be going over in the extended version of this analysis that you're watching, which is included with the Physionic Insiders, along with, do I say it? live sessions with yours truly, a private community, an insider podcast that pulls together all the most important information into one place, written research reviews, and shortened summaries. I mean, need I go on? Anyway, the link to join is uh, down below for the insiders in the description box. Hope to see you there. Anyway, as uh, many will know who've been along the physionic journey, we've been discussing a correlation, so an association between something like all-cause door dwit, all-cause death risk, and coffee consumption. But the researchers did a series of other adjustments as well. I'll list them on the screen. That means that it probably wasn't something like smoking that actually caused this effect, but it can be ruled out that there's some other factor that's not listed here that could muddy the results. I can think of one that I don't see here that has been accounted for in other analyses on coffee. In previous analyses on coffee, researchers also accounted for sleep, but it's absent here. Now, consider if you consume six coffees per day, what impact that will have on your sleep. And since sleep is intimately related to cardiovascular health, along with many other types of health, it seems reasonable that could be a major confounding factor. Of course, we don't know that for a fact, but it's plausible, especially since caffeine content in tea is lower than in coffee. The researchers even mentioned that the population here uh, may be different than those included in other studies. For example, some studies use uh, nurses populations, which means now you're talking about a group of people with a particular behavior or responsibilities that may not extend to the rest of the population, outside the medical field that is. There may also be methodological differences between studies. Okay, but let's assume that everything here is above board. What's the optimal dose according to this analysis? Well, in general, because we're talking about the entire sample, not a subsample, and because there are multiple outcomes, death, cardiovascular disease, and so on, the coffee benefits top out around one to two cups per day. On the other hand, the tea consumption is closer to three cups per day. Again, not distinguishing between green and black tea. In the end, I still think there are some outstanding questions, but the overall message here is that tea may offer more consistent positive effects than coffee, probably because it was equipped with that uh, hammer instead of the flamethrower. Although coffee is still linked to better health as well, up to a point. The amount linked to best outcomes, if that's all-cause mortality or otherwise, is either one to two cups of coffee or about three cups of tea, green or black. But you know that coffee consumption may be more beneficial if timed correctly, which may be another reason we don't see benefits at higher doses. And I cover coffee timing and more in this next video. And if you drink tea, I haven't forgotten you, I cover more right here. See you over there.